can you guys hear me? Yep. Well, yes, hello, we everyone. can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and I know Lakshmi probably already uh, started talking to everyone here. And uh, Linda, what's your background? Um, well, I just well. well, I just uh, wrote a book on youth sports uh, that came awesome. out about a year and a half ago that addresses many of these issues. Um, and I'm a journalist, yes. so it was from that perspective and as a coach. And, yeah, um, you know, I've cited your research many times because you speak to the problems of early specialization and what to do about it. And that's that's the big issue. Yes, yes, exactly. Well, awesome. And the, I know you, it, since we we want to keep this intimate because it gives a discussion, I do these talks all across the world, but uh, maybe we can have each person, if they haven't introduced themselves as well. Chris, you're on. You want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Uh, hello. Good evening or good afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm Chris Crocker. Um, I don't consider myself an expert at anything, <laughs> uh, but a jack of all trades. Um, so I, I, as an adolescent, I grew up playing multiple sports, was an All-American, um, high school football player, All-American, uh, track athlete as well. I went on to play football at Marshall University. And then I went on to enjoy a 12-year career in the NFL. I currently have two daughters who are trying to specialize in tennis. Uh, we're trying to keep them uh, you know, well-rounded and playing other sports, but we're sort of entering that phase as well. Um, Dr. J is uh, our, our daughter's orthopedic. Mm. And so, you know, I'm just really blessed to just, um, you know, enjoy the conversation. I'm always one to uh, never think the cup is full, but half empty. So want to learn a little bit more and just share, you know, my experience. Awesome. Yeah. And it's really valuable from all perspectives. Jason, Hi, thanks for having me. I'm Coach Jason. I'm the founder of Adaptive Movement and creator of the live action fitness role playing game. So I help make fitness fun for kids. It's all about learning how to move, not just learning one particular move and not just about learning one particular sport. I have a background in special needs. So my program is inclusive to kids of all abilities, learning differences, special needs, you name it. Awesome. I think we have Brahma. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, just driving to Costco to get a slice of pizza, but anyway. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, I've used your services uh, during the pandemic. I think uh, Dr. Jay. I remember, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So uh, I have two boys. Uh, my uh, older son is a high school freshman. Uh, he has um, he's played he played three he's still playing he's still in the track team three varsity sports as a freshman year, um, but um, I think his love is baseball. So we are trying to you know I'm trying to help him to see does he need to give up the other two sports other in other seasons to specialize in baseball? We are not sure. Because he's not fully he's five six as a freshman, his pedi pediatrician just told us he has one more growth sport remaining. Um, but to compete a, at a high school level in baseball, um, the fourteen year olds he was competing with were all you know fully grown adults, so he's struggling with that. So we are trying to see when can he just pick one sport. Uh, he was a very good tennis player, but he gave up tennis to play baseball. And he did uh, varsity cross country swim. And right now, since he didn't make it to the baseball team, uh, he just gave a shot to the track, eight hundred meters, and actually won the heat and made the team. So that's great to hear. Yeah, and I've heard a lot of stories like that. So uh, awesome. Well, you know, we're doing. We just started doing these things, and I, I speak to a, a crowd of two thousand people, and I'll speak to a crowd of two people. Uh, but uh, you know, this is we we like this. This is we call these pickup sports chats, and we're going to grow this and and get um, more of an audience on topics that we can talk about it. But we want to always start with evidence, and I actually modeled this after I was doing this for USTA uh, National um, for tennis and. We would do webinars and actually they have such a large following right now. We would have 500 parents on, but there was no discussion, but we, I, I would do a talk and then there would be a lot of chat questions and I try to get to them, but it was a little bit depersonalized. And so I, I really enjoy having the, like seeing a name to a face and actually talking to people. So, so the talk portion is pretty small. The discussion portion is going to be large and we actually, we're going to try to do 30 minutes, but even after our first one, we realized we got to at least do like 40, 45 minutes. So I'm going to give a little bit of advanced stop at any time. Uh, I obviously could do, 
a three hour talk, which none of us have time for. So I'm just going to run through um, the key, the key elements we we have. And, you know, for those that don't, you happy to have you follow me on Twitter because I post relevant, you know, new information that comes up uh, in every way I can be involved as a consultant around the country on youth sports. I am. And, and then I felt like it wasn't even enough. So Lakshmi and I have worked on this mission-based company to try to um, get kids to play sports for fun. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, and also if I'm no other expertise at all is because we have two young boys who are trying to do a lot of different things and, you know, still struggle just as much as any other parents on, on what are the right you know things to do. So when you talk about sports specialization, as Linda was alluding to, some people have really delved in the literature and they're like, yeah, I think I kind of know what it is. And some people are like, oh my gosh, like, you know, not again, like, or don't tell me it's bad. Or if you're a coach, you're like, no, there's nothing wrong with it. And there's like me like, hey, let's look, let's have fun with this. Okay. And let's look at the data and see where we can go with it. That's actually not me. That's uh, Aziz and Zari, <laughs> but striking resemblance. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm a sports doctor. I'm be leaving for an academy meeting soon. And, and so, you know, one of the things we forget is we treat injuries, but we have to remember what this is all for. And you have two models you have a participation model you want to get people playing sports and then promote physical activity and then you have a performance model you want to get people better and so you i walk the line between both i, I work with a lot of high performance athletes but i'm also in the world maybe that's what pick up sports is a little bit more is making sure everyone is has an access to sport and the more of one you have the more performance model you have the less of the other it seems in the way we design our youth sport programs and so we have to kind of be mindful of how our youth sport programming is. And right now it's very slanted towards a performance model. And so a couple of the data points we'll look at is does, does specialization increase injury risk and does it improve performance? And really a question is whom do you trust? Because parents introduce the kid to sport and then they hand over to coaches. And a lot of people are telling you what to do. And, and you're sometimes you're getting thrown off the cliff and you're not sure who you should listen to. And I think that's really one of the fundamental issues here. And when we look at youth sports, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity and you see, and if you look at the first few pictures, this is what we see. This is when people say, you know, if your kid's going to play sport, you say, what league did I sign up for? That's an immediate question. But why does it have to be what league did I sign up for? Is like, did you just play sports is really the question. And this is us doing a pickup sports, just flag football with a high school kid. And so, um, our, to answer our first question, does this lead to injury risk? And and so this is where I've probably spoken across the world the most, every red dot, and this is not even updated, is somewhere across the country and then across the world that have had to talk about this. And um, and then and then as a result, you get a lot of media, uh, you know, folks just like uh, Linda and, and, you know, drew a lot of attention when we started researching about 15 years ago. And... Um, but I think we have to focus more on different areas and solutions rather than just saying it's a problem. It's not a problem for everyone. And we've we've shown that. We'll show you a little bit of data on that. But the culture is where the bigger problem is, the exclusionary uh, culture. Um, if we look and estimate, we published that about, you know, from a different source that 60 million kids play sports and a third are specialized, that's 20 million kids. That's a That's a public health issue. So we're trying to move it towards public health because it affects a lot of people. And then, um, you know, when we design models, when you see new facilities go up and this happens all over and you see these huge playing fields and all these facilities and all this brand new stuff, what are they for? They're not for the 90% who don't play for, who play for fun. They're for high performance. So almost all the investment has gone to high performance, which means less opportunities. Even us in Johns Creek, we have a really great field called Collie Creek, huge park, huge fields. We used to play there from the moment it opened. And then now you go there and we're getting kicked off because every single field is used up uh, by organized sport. Um, see if you can hear this. We this is the of everything we've done. Pretty much every single sport besides volleyball. I've played soccer and done ballet. No, I play all the sports. But more than a third of injuries in kids are sports related. Researchers from Emory University looked at data from 1,200 young athletes over a three-year period. They found that for kids under 12, those that specialized uh, were more likely, about one and a half times more likely to report an injury. When they start specializing too young, you have to acknowledge that their risk of injury and burnout is just higher. The study also found that kids are playing more organized sports, twice as much as they're playing for fun, which can lead to overuse injuries. So what can parents do? 
delay sports specialization until their child is 12 also. Encourage more seasonal participation. Maybe have a three-month period where they're either taking off and resting. Another thing is making sure your young athlete is training fewer hours per week than their age. So if you're like 14 years old, train less than 14 hours per week. Proper warm-ups and cool-downs are critical. Especially as they get older and matches and everything's a little more intense, a little more physical, it's important to make sure your body can like keep up with that. But the most important thing is just to have fun. I'm Marty Salt reporting. So actually, it's interesting. Now I look back at that video, it was about maybe five years ago. So of those three kids, one of them is obviously our son, <laughs> who is an actor <laughs> now. Um, Ruth Marshall, uh, who's on there, is plays at Georgia Tech. And she had tried multiple sports, but then she she was a phenomenal tennis player, but specialized. In, and I can't say anything about health, and, but she she has gone on and done has, has had a good outcome overall. The second one, Harmony, and I can say in general, um, because the mom is open to that, she was in the video, had to quit sport because of injury when she was 13 um, and has not returned um, um, to, to her main sport, which was tennis then. And then the youngest one um, in that video is now 11. He's a multi-sport athlete, does tennis and baseball. And I wouldn't even call him an athlete. He's actually an actor and does things for fun. Mm -hmm. This is about the third that we see. We the third that we see is, you know, like highly specialized. The third is moderate. And a third is like they just play a lot of stuff. That's the actual distribution of our country. Um, but what I don't like is the third that are, that quit or more. And that's right. The, that 13 year old girl is actually the most vulnerable age. And so, you know, when I talk about it, and, you, know, you know, Chris and I have been at dinner and everything like that, too. And I think your girls are going to be fine. But like when I see parents of young girls particularly uh, right now we know there's a higher ACL injury risk. There's a higher concussion risk of reporting. Now our data, we we're publishing new sets of data that show our overuse injury data is almost exclusively on girls. That's the biggest driver. And uh, we have just looked at our data set, uh, sets again, and, it's, and it seems like um, this is a consistent finding. So why I'm a little scared of pushing that pre-adolescent girl more than they should is because this ex exiting. And so that's the outcome we don't want. Um, so when we look at programs, you know, what, what do you think, you know, what do you think programs do? We have two options. You either try to get a million kids to play sports or are you trying to do it to find that one in a million? And so uh, I think a lot of our programs right now, you know, what would you say? You guys are out there a little bit. Are programs in your area more geared towards performance of the best athletes or are they geared towards the most amount of kids playing? What do you guys see? So say it again, geared towards the yeah. Where where what are where, if you look at sport programs now? Where's most of the more of the programs geared towards more programs towards high performance and development of elite level athletics, or are programs more focused on getting the most amount of kids to play performance? Uh, that's very obvious. Uh, you know the high performance athletes. If you look at, you know, I'll take football for instance just the camps, the, you know, the sport specific training that kids are doing in the off season. I think that's also a big issue that we're seeing now is that there's no downtime. Uh, so I would definitely say high performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same in my community. Absolutely. Although there are a lot of, there are recreation programs that are low key and kind of inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows the real action is on the club teams. Exactly. And not not just any club top. team. It's yeah. got to be the best club the, team. The mm -hmm. club team, right? Exactly. And where is your community, Linda? I'm in Summit, New Jersey, which is Jersey. you know 25 miles west of New York. Right. Exactly. And Rama, if I, were you in Ohio? Am I? Do I remember that? Yeah. Group? Right now, I, I we live in Cary, North Carolina. Oh, North Carolina. Headquarters. That's right. Yeah. So, um, it's geared towards performance, but performance is paper performance. Uh, people who can afford can actually get into the performance uh, in a, in a, a leagues. And um, um, again, again, performance is a relative term because uh, a high performer of 12 might not be the highest performer of 16. So. Right. And some of my, some of the best coaches, and I do a lot in tennis, we laugh. We, I had to present at our, our annual, uh, PTR as an international tennis you know conference and James Blake and other, I mean, top, top, 
people were there. And I use the term high performance. And some of the coaches laugh. They say, what, what makes a 12-year-old high performance? I mean, what does high performance mean? And so I actually had to adjust it because can you be uh, an average kid who's performing at your highest? And look at Coach Jason does. So I think I think we have to, I should be careful about our terminology, what, what that means. It actually means do the best that you can do. And that's high performance, right? But our programs are actually geared towards the more, you know, trying to develop elite level athletics. And so it's, I call it, you know, and Linda, I th feel free to publish this if you want. Uh, I talked to Lakshmi about this. We call it the youth sport pyramid scheme. Oh, mm -hmm. I like that. So mm -hmm. what the scheme is, and we live it. We know we're in the scheme right now. We're at a baseball facility. There's 500 kids who play out of that baseball, one baseball facility. So it goes like this. It's a triangle. Get as every kid to start baseball with you and then start figuring out who can make the all-star, who makes the, the national league, which is the highest group, then who makes all-star, then who makes select. And you keep doing it until you finish up with just those kids. And then you don't have a solution for the other 400. And that's yep. the, and then, but then everyone pays. So then the model works because then you financially be viable. But then in the end, all you've done is make, you know, then you don't have a solution for the other 400. And that, that is actually, so people ask me all the time, they want to present on what the dangers of sports specialization are. And I talk about, and I have all the data on injury risk and all these things. And yes, it happens. For that 10%, if you're going to go for it, I'm actually okay with it. Just have the right resources around you. But, but, but let's also create systems that don't have this youth sport pyramid scheme. That's where I think, uh, you know, I think that's the biggest risk. And then, so we've di we dichotomize sports, right? You either have it and you train a lot or you don't have it and then you don't have any other opportunities. Um, so I think, and so I think uh, uh, Rama and his kid is a great example of that. And our kids, I already know I'm prepared. Like our kids play tennis and baseball and all these things. They're probably not going to make their baseball teams. Of, you know, you know, we don't have Chris Crocker genes in our family. And so- so what are we going to do? They love baseball. So, you know, wh why does that have to happen? Why do you have to quit by 11 or 12 or something you really enjoyed playing and you just didn't want to play in college or, you know, if you could have, you would play in high school. So, so anyway, so that, so then, you know, there's multiple areas you have, you know, athlete development is this, like, can you take this kid and, and develop into this kid? That's part of athlete development. But what about this? Can you take this kid and keep him playing? So there's two parts of it. And so this kid right here in our system is very rarely going to end up to be this kid because he's just not going to have the right, because he has no free play opportunities like other countries do, by the way. We have video. Lakshmi and I, it was so fast. We would go out to Italy or, you know, Spain or anything like that too. And I have video like on the beach when we were in Italy and just these kids just playing the most amazing soccer on the beach with nothing but a little tiny little ball. It was like futsal and everyone looked like an amazing stud. And we have our kids who are in there like 12 hours a week trying to, Athlete development is actually what you do throughout the whole week on your own as much as you can with a little supervision, right? You have a little coaching, a little supervision. And, and, you know, I think, you know, I don't want to put words in Chris's mouth, but I can, I, I got to imagine that a lot of your athlete development was you and not a lot of people telling me, maybe I'm wrong. You tell me. Oh, no, that that's correct. I think we were, you know, the generation of children that we grew up around were uh, very self-sufficient self-motivated um didn't have a lot of you know the economic economics of the sports that we played didn't uh require right uh what it requires in tennis or what it requires in gymnastics and so it was just buy the equipment um show up and and right you participate in that sport and the more you loved it the more you immersed yourself in it but just one thing that resonated with me as you were talking about the the pyramid I think when I look at, and I just thought of this, when I look at the sports organizations, you know, tennis, soccer, whatever you may have, where we talk about club sports, I think as the kids or the organizations go up the pyramid, I think sometimes if a kid is stuck at the bottom of the pyramid because of his athletic ability or just his deficiencies, right, then that's tough to keep the kid playing as well. So, you know, the organizations have right a big you know uh they have a big say in sort of the kid being able to progress as well i think the parents obviously we're, we're the 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 ones who are really um the the first responders i guess you would say right we're really on the ground and we're doing it with our children but it's a yin and yang i think in, in my opinion it's not just one 
part that's flawed. That there's sort of no, numerous. So when we talk about, and this is, you know, um, you know, for the parents who have kids, including me, I was on, you know, Jeff Frankfurt's podcast, Pure Athlete, which is a really nice podcast, is we don't have Chris Crocker and Jeff Frankfurt who played, you know, for the Braves. And we don't have those genes. So then we have Indian families and other families that have maybe, with all due respect, Ram, I'm sure you're a phenomenal athlete, but maybe you have average genes. But then in order to keep up with the better genes, you have to overtrain them. So then you run that risk. And that's what we end up seeing a lot. Well, I have to do that to keep, you know, to keep up with them. There's two other very specific elements that happen in the sports world. One is on onset of maturation. So if you're late mature versus early mature, the whole, the system is set up obviously to benefit the early matures. So then you also, in the pyramid scheme, you lose out if you're late mature, which if you hang on to those kids, you don't know what, you, you should not evaluate anyone's talent until they've had testosterone for a boy or gone through, um, got close to, you know, adolescence for a girl. And then the other one is called, as you probably already know, the relative age effect, which is just a subset of your, um, this bias towards the early mature. So in other words, if you are born the first three months of the year, uh, January, February, March, you have a better chance than you are if you were born in, you know, late summer when you miss out on cutoffs. And so just from that alone, those two things can put someone at a, at a you know, big disadvantage and that may actually push them out of sport before they can. So, so this is those are the nuances of, of athlete. You know, so and you know, Lakshmi said, remind. Re, let's make sure we talk about op, you know, like uh, solutions. And I don't think we have all the solutions at all when we do pickup sports. And you know, I can talk about pickup sports because we make. There's no money. We're not making any money. We're bleeding thousands of dollars to just to get kids to do the right thing right now. And so when you have environments where kids are like brothers and siblings and everyone can play in one environment. We do like seven, 11 years old. It's not exclusionary, but you make it a safe environment and everyone can have touches and there's no boys and girls can play mixed gender, you know, until like 10 or 11 years old at elementary school. Then, then you, you solve all those problems. You solve a lot of those problems and you keep their interest. You need to keep their interest to get them at least through adolescence. And it doesn't have, it doesn't matter where the interest is. It doesn't have to be on a team and you can develop it, you know? So, and I think, um, you know, we are fooled. Remember we had showed that video of that lady getting pushed off the cliff that, you know, um, you know, Chris, you're in pretty good environments, you know, but I I'm confident that, you know, we have many parents that are fooled by the concept that, you know, if you don't do this, you have no shot. And that's, you know, and that's where I'm going to show you kind of least support you with data here. Yeah. Yeah. Please do. Because the other thing that sort of came to mind is, is, and I'm guilty of some of this as well, because, you know, where I look at or how I look at sports, my perspective is completely different sometimes because, you know, I've done it, you know? And so I think that um, most parents, once you try to figure out what is the standard, right? When you're looking at kids and their development and where they are at a certain age. And I think that we are continually chasing that standard or chasing that, that child. And even myself, you know, what you've learned is, is that children develop at their own pace. And so the overtraining, like you mentioned, is a huge issue because we're just, hey, we'll never catch up if, if our children aren't per se doing that. And I think that's sort of a challenge is, is, is sort of changing that model, you know, of, of just thinking that, you know, our kids, we want our kids to be that. And they may end up being that, but they're going to end up being that on their own timeline. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we did, we published this in 2013. It was based on data preceding that. This is probably the first actual paper of a, of a review on sports specialization. We looked at all the sports that had been published to the date that we had access to. And um, this is, to the left will be any sports, a small typo, a type, I'm sorry. But to the left is all the sports that specialized before 12, you don't, all you have to do is look at the circles. There was only two. And it was really the same sport, which is gymnastics, rhythm gymnastics. And every other sport always had a later specialization to develop elite level status. Okay. So since then, we've done a, a true systematic review. This published in 2019. It's even more rigorous and more new data that came has come out. More studies, fortunately, and a little bit better studies. And look at elite, first of all, there were 19 studies we evaluated um, and zero out of 19 showed benefit to early specialization. The mean age, and this is across sports, you can see the type of sports here, 
for elite level status was 14 to 15 and sometimes even 16. But um, but rarely was it much earlier than that, okay? And so this is, uh, and, and the non-elite peers almost convincingly were lower uh, ages of specialization. So we have seen zero data to show it in groups that's different than individual. Like, so we, I didn't put the, it was so much data. We did a study on the top 250 WTA players um, and we looked at their age of specialization and there were half of them or so had very early specialization and half of them were, you know, uh, 10 or later. And that's late for tennis, if you can believe it. And they all, they didn't change their ranking. So it didn't matter which path you ended up doing in WTA. So now certain sports are notoriously young. So those are the ones that, that try to peak when they're when they're at um, uh, before skeletal maturity, like gymnastics. So they do specialize early, and we get that. But for most other sports, fourteen years old was a come out. The other thing, Chris knows this because I told him. Um, but um, you know, UCLA studies show that you know you're more likely to be a college athlete if you're student if you're you have a first degree relative that was college or professional athlete. Just the genetic predisposition alone gives you that chance. And you just have to have the proper training environment to give you the chance to get to college. And then professional athletics is unpredictable. You just don't, you can't, there's so many factors that are involved in, but to get to college, I can tell you that, you know, you know, you know, Chris and his wife, you know, his wife played college basketball. I said, you already have good, you have great genes. You just need great environment. You know, that's it. So, and that, that doesn't happen right. That happens over time too. And so, um, you, you work out all your kinks through adolescence, we call it adolescent awkwardness. And so, yeah, not everyone is, even LeBron with genes, like, you know, Bronny, I don't know what kind of chance he has to go to professional, but he had a good chance to go college, right? And he, you know, he went to USC. Mm -hmm. this, this may be one of the more important, see, I'm on the participation side. This is a five-year French study that took school-aged children. I don't know if Lakshmi even knows of this one. And they either basically were sports samplers which were kids who tried a lot of different things. And then five years later, they said, what are you doing? The majority of those kids were still active in sport. And then if you took sports specializers, they were more likely to be performers, less likely to be involved in sport. So it really comes down to what risks do you want to take with your child? If you want to push them, it's fine, but you got to be okay with the fact that either they might get hurt or quit. And, and that's okay, but are you getting an advantage? If you want to be, um, this is what we call like the late specialization model. We like to try to get kids to do it late adolescence if we can. Um, and that's high school. Rama was wondering, yes, it's fine. You know, by now these days, high schools, most people are in late adolescence. We have a lot of short-term athlete development, right? That happens in early adolescence. And, you know, the, the issue, I think I brought this up last time, is that, you know, um, short-term adolescent, uh, short-term development does work. So if you want your kid to be the best, this is my kid. Here, our kid, you know, listen to him when he was seven hitting a ball, right? And, you know, I get excited too. I mean, look at him hit the ball. I mean, seven. But what you might notice in that is that what is he wearing? Can anyone tell what he's wearing? What kind of pants is he wearing? Those are those are baseball well, pants. Baseball. <laughs> we were just stopping by to say hi to some tennis buddies. And I said, I'll, I'll hit in for like 10 minutes. And then he was on his way to baseball practice and it, I just grabbed a racket from the back and said, why don't you, you want to hit a few balls with one of my, you know, teammates. And he went out there and just hit like 50 balls in a row, you know, when he's, but then, but then going? yeah, that's Millen, that's the little guy. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, and so, but if you want, if you want to be the bet and remember, this is a transfer of skills. This is a thing that people don't always see. This is that transfer of skills. The same kid who doesn't miss a ball 50 times. He's also the same kid who hits, you know, nine out of 10 balls pitched to him. So you develop a transfer of skills from one sport to another sport to another sport, and that benefit people are missing, right? And the second thing is if you want to be, you want short-term development, if you want to be the best 12-year-old, it's easy. Just train them like hell, and, and then you'll get the best 12-year-old probably. I mean, you have a good chance of doing that. You also have a good chance of pushing them out of the sport. <laughs> but, and if you're willing to take that, now when, when you get past middle and late adolescence, Will that have mattered? And our data suggests that it doesn't matter. And then, so your best 12 and unders in tennis are routinely not the best 18 and under in tennis. And so you have to be prepared for that. You have exceptions. You know, you, you can't look at the Coco Goffs or someone who's a complete outlier. No matter what you do, she was going to be successful. Like, you can't. That's a complete outlier. 
But if you look at the large population of kids, your, your short-term athlete development model works for short-term, okay? Any questions or thoughts on that? So this is kind of what I leave is like, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna take the risk, take it. And I don't judge. I honestly don't judge. I see a lot of families, I remember a third or specialist. So I don't, I don't judge if they come in and they say, Hey, I want to, I've chosen to specialize. I said, we need to build a support system around you. So for here, we have that, like we have easy access to us. I have an athletic trainers all over, and, but most places don't have that access. And then we've looked at quality of life studies too. And so, you know, you can get by if you have the right family network. And if you do specialize it means that you have parents who don't push you about winning, but they worry, worry about athlete development, that you're enjoying it. And then you have intrinsic drive and what we call resilience. Resilience for the kid. That means that the kid doesn't mind if they get hurt. They don't mind if they lose or have a negative experience. They wipe themselves off and they get back there. Lakshmi and I have two children. One, one child is resilient. That's Millen. The other child, like if something happens, he's like, I'm out. <laughs> he's not always teetering about quick. So you have to know your child. And so if your child, if you have the right family network, I mean, the support, I mean, support, support saying coaching, you know, who's focused on athlete development and not on short-term results and parents, then, that, then, then specialization is okay. Okay. And then, and then what in the stage of specialization, I have a little slide on that as well, too. Any questions on that decision right there? And then we'll talk about the developmental stage. I have a question. Yes. I mean, at what age I mean, I know it varies by sport and it varies by child and all of that and varies by sex, but you know, what is, what's the earliest, I, you know, I see with all these um, caveats that specialization can not be the end of the world, mm. but at what point is it too early? I guess maybe that's a better way to ask the question. Yeah. Well, if you ask me my very honest opinion, I don't think, I don't think there should be really almost any pre-adolescent kid who should specialize in one sport. I don't mind if they play it year round, but yeah. we're talking about like not playing anything else. And the only outlier could be gymnastics because their peak is earlier, but some want to go to, you know, do it in college, but some of the time times they peak early. But outside of that, um, I don't see now, <clears throat> is that changing what happens at NCAA? This is NCAA gold data where you look at the, you know, how many, the percentage that specialized before 12, and you'll see the most do. And where problem sports, these are the sports that we tend to study is the top four for girls, gymnastics, we've already given, we gave that up. Tennis is right behind it, then soccer and basketball. I definitely see why gymnastics, I kind of see tennis. I have no idea why we developed a culture where soccer and basketball and team sports are so specialized, so young. From an athlete development point of view, there's just, there's no advantage. And then the sports you don't see it at are the sports that are all about athleticism. Chris didn't, he didn't need to play football 12 months here. He's a great athlete. Like he could do anything. He'd be successful. Like, so here's where for football and lacrosse, they all know it. Cause I did the NFL combines for 20 years. I don't know if you know that Chris. And I was always there every year. And I always asked them when I was doing this study, I was like, how many sports you play in high school? They all laughed. They're like, I played everything. Everything. Yeah. It was just, we played. Every athlete. They season. were like, yeah, you know, you were there. I, I was probably there. What year did you go through the combines? Um, let me see. 2002. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was there. Yeah, so it was a long time ago, but but I think the science, right? You you speak a lot about the science and the data, and it definitely it it's true. I guess when we talk about team sports, um, because the, the better athletes, the athlete, the elite athletes that I I grew up with, that I played with or against uh, during my adolescence and my professional career, always were better at another sport. They just decided to specialize in that one sport and they didn't actually decide until it was time to graduate so you know it's like okay i'm going to graduate all right i'm just going to go to university of north carolina and play football or i'm going to go to university of north carolina and play both um that's funny yeah. I, just, <laughs> I just think the the you know and a lot of our decisions were based off of you know what could we do you know I, I, it just it just was very fun to immerse ourselves in a lot of different things and um you know i think some of the the sports, the elitist sports, where you say gymnastics, tennis, um, I'm sure there's a few other, but those sports, golf, right? Um, the economics of it will push kids out of it as well. It just doesn't allow kids to play. And I think that the expense mm -hmm. of it sometimes, just, so the expense of it pushes a parent a little overboard as well. 
because you know you want to see progress and in order to see progress you think you need more time on the court and uh that's not necessarily true so I, I think you know no adolescents should just play one sport in my opinion and that's just real world experiences it has nothing to do with the data yeah well yeah I mean that that's the next category and and I think uh, still about a third or even 30 to 40 percent still only do but uh, yeah, I would like that too, but I'm okay. I get it. But if I were even advising the best of the best athlete, you know, and they say, I really want to focus on tennis only. And they were 10 years old, you know, and they're pre-adolescent be like, why, you know? So, so, um, um, the one, you know, you talked about, I think Linda was talking about, uh, um, like what stage, when to specialize. So we published this, you know, this is based on kind of expert opinion, a little bit of the data that you've seen. So we call them early entry sports. Those are gymnastics, maybe swimming and diving, but almost all mid individual and team, like no earlier than middle adolescence. And actually some people do better with what we call endurance sports when they do it later. So running and triathlons and all those things, there you don't need to do any of that to, and you get better as you get older. So I think we had to be a little you know, careful at that. And doesn't mean you have to even do organized sport. And again, we talked about op opportunities. As long as you're building athlete fundamental skills and having fun, that's what free play is, which is such a missing part of what we do is playing sports for fun is that. So um, I'm going to just show that my last couple of slides, I want to engage us. I think there's a hand up. I don't know. Lakshmi, do you see a hand up? Um, oh, yes. Rama did. Yes. Yep. Okay, yeah. Rama. I just had uh, one question. Um, um, my son had years back, he had a scholarship for a summer camp at Wake Forest and uh, Wake Forest University. And I was chatting with the head coach of the women's tennis team. and um, I'm not sure if this discussion came around that time, and he said that the girls uh, have to specialize early, but uh, for a boy, he said that it makes more sense for the boy to train when he's a fully grown adult, put more time in training. Uh, for example, he said that if a boy is like 12 and 5'3", five, 5'4", five, um, you know, especially with tennis, if he's 6'3", six, 6'4", six, the training might look different. Has there been any studies on that? Because if a fully grown, like if he's a 12 inches or even six inches taller, his reach might be different. So he might, his training might change. Uh, he might get to the balls he was not getting when he was 12 years old and 5'3", five, 5'4". Five, well, absolutely. I mean, I'm the team doctor for Georgia Tech Tennis. And, you know, we, we actually love it when a kid is a late developer. Uh, Andres Martin, our number one player, he, he trained in Flowery Branch. I mean, what kind of tennis in Flowery Branch, Chris? That's where the Falcons play. They don't play tennis there. This kid was like a late, he's a he's a number one player in the team and he beat, you know, like Nick Karios' doubles partner in an ATP event, but he just developed. I mean, he developed, I mean, he got in at 18 and now he's he's killing. He's going to try to turn, play professionally. But uh, um, so uh, I think when you start with your goals, you know, again, like, you know, if your goal is to play, you have a long-term goal of playing college, then I don't think you need to, you know, that's for boys and girls. And, and so, you know, this, I don't think the, the gender difference about whether you, it's a stage of development, the stage of development for girls is two to three years younger. That That's the biggest difference there. So you might see a girl specialize younger at 12 or 13, but she may already be middle, late adolescence by then. And the boy won't even be close. So that's why I'm okay with the age difference, but not the stage of development difference. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? And this is just our summary of what we do. And this kind of, we put this up for Emory. It's kind of consumer facing, but exactly what Chris was talking about. Like, you know, what do you do in pre-adolescence? Play for fun, focus on fun, you know, don't overtrain and then, and then don't specialize in pre-adolescence. So that's about up to um, 11 years old for a girl, up to 13 years old for a boy. So that includes part of middle school. And then in adolescence, which is 11 to about 14 for girls, about 13 to 15 or 16 for boys, still play other sports if you can, but build coordination and strength. That's what's lacking in our culture. We're not, kids aren't strong, girls aren't strong. And so you get knee valgus and they injure themselves, do other things and they can't tolerate the demand. So our research experts who do our sports performance research center focus a lot on neuromuscular training and that can happen formally or you could do it through other sport build coordination and movement patterns in other sport and i wrote these up for usta just so you know this is i wrote the template for usta um for tennis um and so it's 
template after this, all the same concepts, just we just suggested the little bit, make it tennis specific. And then finally, you have to go for it at some point. If you want to be good, you do have to specialize. If you want to make a high school team, you got to sometimes pick a sport and play high school. Not everyone's Chris Crocker, or Jeff Frank Boer. Mm -hmm. And so I'm okay with it. You know, like if you say I want to do, but, but you see this, I've heard this a lot too. Um, I think uh, um, Rama talked about his son switching over and I've had a lot of friends, kids do that. And that's great. That's what the mobility should be okay. Like, you know, like, you know, you don't make baseball, you got to do something, you know? And so I like that a lot. Track is actually really great. They always take everyone, but uh, I wish that, that there were still opportunities for those kids to do those things. They like, just cause you didn't make your high school team that youth sport pyramid scheme doesn't have to work against you. Like you should be able to have an opportunity to play, pick up baseball, basketball and football, whatever it is you want to do. You won't be good enough to do high school or college. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, thoughts? you know, in in my experience, um, so many many parents, you know, say they don't want to do this stuff, but they feel they have to because even if they just want to, when I say they feel they have to do the early specialization, um, even though they don't want to, be starting as young as elementary school or at least joining these travel teams, you know, year round. And as much as I can say, oh, but the data doesn't show, you know, that early specialization generally doesn't pay off, burnout, injuries. I think there's so much anxiety among parents about their kids missing out. Mm -hmm. And they find that, you know, because it, it's also, um, because it's like a race to the bottom with <clears throat> the organized, some of the organized sports, they will be left out because there is the reality yeah. that those kids yeah. will have more skill and some of them are going to stay together and they're going to be a unit, you know, and it's, yeah. I always feel bad saying, you know, well, you don't want to count on the other, those kids getting injured, even though it might happen or yeah. they might quit. But I, that's what I really yeah. struggle with trying to capture, convey the message that there's data, which you've just shared with us to, sh that shows this is not the wise move. How do you how do you rectify yeah. that? First of all, what what's happening that is real. Kids aren't going to make teams. There's also other relationships. You don't play on a travel or club team. They know the high school coach or they are the high school volunteer yep. coach or whatever. And then so they're shut out. And it's going to happen. I'm already prepared myself for those things to happen to our own kids. And it's already happened at the lower level. It's kind of crazy. Like our you know kid didn't get selected for the all star team and he was picked by his own coach. But even my own friends who I coach their kids didn't pick him to even do the tryouts. It was. <laughs> I, but I'm fully prepared. We even prepared our kid for that. Mm -hmm. So those things are going to continue to happen. And so I, I do. And, and Chris said, you know, Hey, look, we should specialize. I want to even not even through middle adolescence. I get it. I think pre-adolescent, no, it's in no benefit for anyone, even to make your high school team. Adolescence. Yes. There are situations where you're going to need to do that. There's, there's environments where you need to do that and be a part of that. What I would recommend is, build an athlete. And I know Chris can definitely back me on this part, but build the athlete. How do you build the athlete? You don't build the athlete by playing your sport over and over and over again. You build the athlete by doing other things and diversify your motor movement and, and have other exposures. And what we are trying to do when we talk about like pickup sports is actually provide an environment that's not unfortunately there. They used to be there where you could go do it on your own. And, and the last, the, the socioeconomic thing, we published a study, it's more money, more problems that you could actually, the kids who actually played the most were from the lowest socioeconomic, you know, um, environments in our study. We, you know, there are 1,200, and this is in Chicagoland area, because they played the most free play. They did the most on their own. And the kids who came from the highest socioeconomic, mm -hmm. you know, it's actually up in my office somewhere. This it was in John's Creek Carroll too. We, but we published it and they, we did a little article on that. Um, and then the kids who had the highest money actually had the highest risk they specialized the most and even though they had all the money in the world so it's not that you can't play sports a lot mm -hmm. it's about who's what environment you're in so when you're on your own and you're playing on your own if you're like i'm tired i'm feeling like my knees bother me you just stop but if you're feeling like i feel good and no one's telling me to stop you just keep going and i'm i'm actually totally fine with that right. and that's what we don't have and that's what's missing um so yeah i'm okay with them doing it and at some point you have to accept you may not make the team, but yeah. You but I think, um, you know, one sorry. of, sorry, one of the um, uh, points that Linda is making, which I believe is very real, is that when you're in it as a parent and your 
right, your kids' friends are all making these teams and they're ready to to get to the next level. A lot of times you kind of don't see the problem until you're on the other end of it. This has kind of been one of our uphill battles of getting this message out is that um, parents, when your kids are younger, you don't realize it's a problem until your kids have kind of grown out and then they're burnt out and then it's too late. So mm -hmm. how do we get the message from parents of older kids that have been through it um, to help inform kind of the parents of younger kids? Like, hey, there is a better way. Um, you don't have to drink the Kool-Aid and, you know, go this route because it is hard um, to, to get out of it, especially if the kids have made friends with those travel mm -hmm. teams. But um, you know, when you're going four nights a week to one, you know, soccer group, but then you have multiple kids, it's, it's impossible to juggle. And it's a real, it's a tough decision. So I feel for those parents, but um, it, uh, you know, a lot of times they're going in blindly without the information of what happens on the other end of it a few years mm -hmm. from now. So that's what we need to try to educate. Doc, I actually have a question because, you know, I think when I look at my children's sort of progression through their sports, uh, the one thing that was always just very evident is that my kids were always, and they still are, the most athletic. It didn't matter what sport they yeah. you know, chose or what field they stepped onto. It's it was just clear that they was off. But that didn't necessarily quantify success, right? They they were the most athletic, but they weren't the most skillful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know I'll just use an example. Say the six through ten, right? They were just athletic, crazy, but just weren't very skillful. Um, and what I'm seeing lately, and I'll take my 12 year old, is that the kids who were uh, super successful, um, say that six to 10, didn't matter what sports. Um, now I'm seeing my oldest pass those kids um, because the skill set is catching up and in the athleticism is taking over. And mm -hmm. so I say that because mm -hmm. I'm always really curious to know how you all, and I, I would like to see the study, how do you all quantify athleticism? <laughs> Um, and you know, how does that match up to the paradigm or just the trend of catching the kids who were really good and then you're passing those kids? Uh, because I think, um, you know, Linda said something about parents are always really concerned that our kids are gonna not catch up, right? They're gonna, they're gonna get left behind and they're not mm -hmm. gonna make those teams and et cetera. But I'm seeing the more athletic kids who just stick with it. Um, and not just my children, but but other children where you can see, okay, if they just stick with it, the skill set will catch up and and they're going to be okay. Um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So when we did the systematic review, we looked at there's two types of performance measures. One, you know, one is the obvious, like, you know, making elite level status versus non-elite, like if you make a elite national team versus not making it. The other one is what's called task performance. And that's being able to do your jump height, you know, or strength in, in certain specific object, uh, you know, objective measures. And so for both of those, um, the specialization did not benefit them. The uh, There's actually a downside. We have one published study on looking at uh, neuromuscular mechanics in specialized girls versus those that don't specialize. And their mechanics are poor. So they have more knee valve because their knees collapse more and they don't have the same type of optimal mechanics because they specialize. So we're actually, not only we're seeing no difference with the, with the, it's, it's about movement patterns, right? So so we're seeing that the movement patterns and those things don't develop well. And so you're right, this all goes to what we're talking about, you know, is that the athleticism eventually takes over in most situations. And so your goal is actually build the athleticism and fun in the, in the first two stages, which is pre-adolescence and adolescence. And there's certain sports that have skill, tennis and, you know, um, gymnastics and even a, a lot of sports, basketball and all, they have skill. You work on skill. Skill stuff isn't isn't what's what's creating the problem, actually, because you can shoot free throws all day long on your own and no one's going to get hurt. OK, you don't get burnt mm -hmm. out doing that. It's actually negative, intense, frequent competition is your biggest risk. And that's actually where we lose most of the kids. And and I'll leave this because we like to stay on time. We should probably go and I have patience here in a minute. USDA's data, and I think I shared it with you, Chris, at, at every age division, marketing data shows that from 12s to 14s to 16s to 18s, um, and Linda, be careful. Make sure you talk to me before you put this in any um, uh, public setting because that's a, <laughs> an internal committee. You lose a third of your um, um, kids. So that means you're going, it's, it's a reverse pyramid, right? 
So by 16s, you've lost two thirds of your kids. By 18s, you've lost, you know, majority of your kids. And 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 if you were a business, you'd be out of business. That's what we always say, because you're you're just the environment's not great. And so that's why we're and I'm on the national committee. We push hard for junior team tennis, but junior team tennis and this is too tennis like, but it's not cool after 12. But I, you know, I just talked to Ryan. You know, Ryan Ryan's um, top level. Uh, you know, he trains at National Training Center. And I said, did you play green ball and all that stuff? He said, yeah, I loved it. I played. Till I was about, he played Alta and all these like team tennis until he was like 10 or so. But then he's too good. It's not cool anymore after that. So then now you go off to tournaments. Now he's doing great, but he's in that 1%. Yeah. So, so maybe I'll leave it. If you guys want to keep discussing this, I actually have to go and yeah, have to go. Patients. But this is awesome. I hope yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Yeah, I mean, thank you all for coming. Um, maybe the next one and the next chat we'll do will be around um, skill development and athleticism. I know Jason does a lot of work in that area. So, you know, we'd love to keep that conversation going and and do this again. And, you know, we'd love your feedback and just try to keep keep going with what we're doing. And I'll try to connect with each of you guys individually as well. Okay. Thank you very much. How did you find us? I, I think, I'm not sure. Someone posted it on Twitter or something. I'm like, oh, I need to be on that. I need to do yeah, that. Be, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for joining us. And anything you can do to get messaging out, you know, is really helpful, the right messaging and all of you. Okay. So thank I'm you. always thank quoting you, everyone. your studies. <laughs> They're not all mine, but unfortunately or fortunately, I'm, I'm involved with a lot of them. <laughs> find a different path and do something like pick up sports and actually make something happen rather than keep publishing about stuff so but thank you okay all right thank you bye, all. bye chris bye, bye guys